So the FDA did not require uh, pre-market testing, uh, but you saw that J&J, &J, before they released any product, did substantial amount of testing, right? Before they released product to the public, they did x-ray, they did Polaroid light, uh, and then since the 70s, they did TEM. So they did do testing before they released it. They just didn't do testing um, like they do for drugs, where you do clinical trials and things like that, that pre-market testing. But they did a uh, substantial amount of testing before they released it uh, to the public face right there to say. And the <coughs> FDA uh, stays involved and has authority over cosmetic talc to the extent that they can require you to warn of a health hazard, and we'll see and talk about that. They can require you to take your product off the market uh, if, uh, if they find a health hazard. They can inspect you. Lawsuits. You say it's possible, because we have to. 
That's what a good company does. And then they do an analysis with the doctors. And they say, no, the evidence doesn't support it. They knew that when they were asking Dr. Hopkins that. You also heard the judge gave you an instruction that both sides agreed to. These adverse event reports that Jane has been getting since these lawsuits started in 2017, they've been sending all the ones in those binders Dr. Hopkins got, all of them went to the FDA. They went to the FDA. The FDA knows about this. The FDA's never changed their mind that there's no hazard with top of powder. The FDA's never required a warning. They've never changed that stance. They know about these lawsuits. Everybody knows. You saw they show you the New York Times article from last year. It's no secret. A lot of you said in jury selection, you know. The plaintiff's lawyers talked about, the plaintiffs themselves, some of them talked about the lawyer commercials. There's no secret. The FDA knows this, these allegations are there. They don't believe it's true. They don't believe it's supported by the evidence. All of those adverse events driven by lawsuits. Most times you get adverse events from doctors, right? Your doctor reports. Every one of them, I think he found one out of hundreds from somebody that wasn't a lawyer, might have been a duplicate of a lawyer, but one. But none from any doctors. It's been all over the press. Doctors know about it. They know about this issue. There's no science to support it. Where's that evidence? All of these reported, and there's a, um, they may claim, oh, all the stuff in the complaint, you don't put it in. This is the FDA has a very specific format that requires you to, they require you to fill out. They have a, um, uh, and I'm not as good as computers as some of them, code on the other side, but they have computer systems where you can uh, pull up and log the exact kind of information you want. So the FDA has a very specific format in terms of the information they want. And they may say, oh, you can put all the information that's in the complaint in the form. Well, you put what the FDA wants you to put, what they dictate you put in this midwife <coughs> form. And they may send each and every one of these serious adverse reports, these allegations from these lawsuits to the FDA. And the FDA confirmed receipt, the FDA number on the, on the website of each and every one of them. And what's the testing evidence here? The testing evidence comes from the guy who did test, but uh, uh, talks about how, what his lab did. And all of the bottle, many of the bottles he got from plaintiff's lawyers came from eBay, Remember? Bought from eBay. Some came from plaintiff's lawyers' relatives. Uh, and they have the burden of proof. No testing expert, no biological markers of asbestos exposure in any of the plaintiffs, and no bottles of talcum powder that any of them used that could be tested. You didn't test any bottles that the plaintiffs used. Some of you may have caught this when he said, what does your common sense tell you about this? Every single bottle, J and J Tonkin powder, the Dr. Long would just pull, pull off the shelf and test it. Even he had to admit, you couldn't even see anything that, that they could call asbestos. Nothing. All the off-the-shelf bottles, even they had to admit, no asbestos. And even he said, in, in almost 40% of the bottles that they tested, they couldn't find any fragment they could even call asbestos. Nothing. But everything off the shelf, no asbestos. And they talked about exposure analysis, and that's what um, you do to figure out if there is asbestos, if you're getting more than background, how much, you know, they simulate the exposure. Like they, they do, they, they model in this lab how you use the powder, and then they collect the dust to simulate how much, if there is asbestos exposure you get. He didn't do an exposure analysis for a single plaintiff in this case. He's done it in other cases, but he didn't do it for any of the plaintiffs here. Is when you got four really sick and sympathetic plaintiffs against a big company, I guess they think they don't need any evidence. They, don't need, they didn't bring anyone. They talked about shower, shower, Miss McNeil's bed sheets. They didn't do an exposure analysis to see whether that actually causes more than background inhalation. They didn't do that study if there is asbestos. They didn't do a study about uh, whether or she, she alleged she puts in her boots, no exposure analysis. No exposure analysis for how Mr. Ronnie used it, how Mr. Borden used it. They just used one for some other plaintiffs who used it in no way like this and me. I'll say, oh, you know, the jury won't care about the evidence. They had the burden of proof. They didn't bring you it. You gotta bring it. Even if you got a case against a big company, you gotta bring it. And they used 70 
an 80-year-old unsealed bottles for his exposure, the two exposure analysis he did. Okay. Don't relate to these ones. These are the oldest bottles he can find. One from the plaintiff's lawyer's relative, remember that? Poles were as big as, much bigger than they are now. Even he had to admit his pesticide fibers could fit in there. I submit to you the plaintiff's case when it comes to the company documents. When you don't have evidence, you cause confusion. You try to cherry pick. You try to mislead. And I'm going to show you that. You know, this may be a good time to make sense for it. And then in her 1991 paper, 
as we looked at, she talks about her heavy liquid density concentration method, and she says, as we looked at, that it's equally accurate. Not that it's more sensitive, that it's equally accurate than traditional methods. <coughs> and Dr. Blount, complainant of her creed, she did not use TEM. She did not use the super duper microscope in her test. She, did, she just used the pop polaroids like on the top. She did not use the super And then, <coughs> if we go here, she said she tested high grade top products for five deposits in Montana, three in Vermont, and one each in North Carolina and Alabama. Three in Vermont, she says, right? And then, in the 1991 paper, she says that she finds in sample I needles and fibers, right? But then in her paper, she calls sample I chemoline. She doesn't say chemoline is that, but she says chemoline, right? And then to go further, she said, the results when compared to the aspect ratios determined for tremolite asbestos, the density M by Campbell shows sample I has a distribution similar to asbestos. Similar. Not used to TDM, but similar. She says tremolite. And then you saw the key the plaintiffs showed you. J and J produced the key, the Jamie base number. And it is produced consecutive base, but it doesn't seem to match the paper. Says, look, this key says I is the Windsor J and J Tau, JKL, also other Vermont deposits, M is Troy, New York. So that's one, two, three, four Vermont deposits. When Dr. Wyoff says in this study, they were three, right? Then they showed you another key. And these are the 3191, which they claim is the Dr. Blount study. But again, it doesn't seem to match up. I is Windsor, but one, two, three, four, five Vermont samples. When she says there are only three. So it doesn't, the keys don't seem to match up in the study in terms of the number of samples. And then something else didn't add up about this paper. Her claim that she found trace amounts of asbestos in J and J's top. She has a graph here about sample I, and she has tau, and she has, and she's comparing it to tremolite asbestos, and she said it has similar aspect ratios. And this is Vermont tau. You saw, there's no dispute, that J and J, her paper is 1991, that J and J was using from Vermont, from 1964 to 2003, right? She calls it Vermont Windsor Tau. But then you heard Dr. Longo, this is Dr. Longo's trial testimony from <coughs> 2019. Dr. Longo, their testing expert, said, when you start going from Italian mines to the Vermont mines, the Vermont mines can't have tau, I mean tremolite in it. The Vermont mines can't have tremolite in it. She's saying there's tremolite in the Vermont sample. He's saying the Vermont mines can't have trouble, right? He says, you're talking, he says, you can ask about the actual bottles that was lab tested. And he says, correct, as you start hitting into the Vermont years, you change from mostly all tremolite to mostly all anthopolite. And it makes the change right there. In other words, there was tremolite in Italy, anthopolite in Vermont. Dr. Longo says you can't have tremolite in Vermont. And Dr. Blanc claims to find tremolite, but then you saw Dr. Longo was shown a page from her deposition where she was asked some questions about this 1991 study by plaintiffs and by defendants, and she was asked, so I, as I understand it, if you have a sample I, and for example, let's say the Johnson & Johnson's product the next time you don't want that sample I necessarily to be Johnson & Johnson, because then you'll know what the results are before you start. And she says, I don't want to, let me, I, I won't know, even if I put I there, I wouldn't know. I want the letter, I want the letter to be different each time. So 
eyes, JJ's eye in 1990, according to her testimony, it wouldn't be 91. And then she said, in different orders, so that I don't, I have no idea which, which, which one's which when I'm running it, so I'm not biased subconsciously, subconsciously because that can happen. So that's why I put these numbers. And then she says, unfortunately, I didn't make a good enough record, and I think some of them got a little mixed up. That's the author of the paper saying, you know what? I think I might have got a little mixed up on this. And there's no evidence here that Dr. Blount permitted anybody else to test what she looked at. No evidence that anyone tested Dr. Blount's samples for her. And what we do know is that the samples tested by J and J in the 90s on their line by GEM by Paul doesn't match up with her claim that there's trace amounts in the asbestos. And she says she might have got a little mixed up. And her claim to find tremolite in the lot is Dr. Longo says there's no tremolite there. So something doesn't add up about uh, Dr. Blount's paper. And then Dr. Blount says this whole thing, the thing that finds trace amounts, is blown out of proportion. And it turned out how blown out of proportion <coughs> Something doesn't quite add up to the reliance on it. In fact, it doesn't say J and J in the published paper. Then they showed you this document. And uh, I submit to you, they showed you a lot of things. So Dr. Longo was asked about um, what he looked at in J and J's documents. And he said, uh, he admitted, of all of the thousands of documents I looked at, there was only about 12 that actually said the word asbestos. The thousands, only 12. And then he admitted, yeah, some of them were samples that J&J intentionally spiked with asbestos as part of their, <coughs> excuse me, as part of their uh, research projects. Some of those related to industrial talc, not cosmetic talc. Some of them related to ore products where we did explo explo exploration that weren't used. Some of them related to mine exploration, not finished product. <coughs> what he didn't show are documents, testing results, Johnson & Johnson's actual product that found asbestos. And we don't have that. You're like, oh, let's, let's find stuff we spiked. Let's find stuff in ore samples we never used. Let's find stuff in some mine, some section of the mine miles away we never used. Where's the testing on the actual samples? And this is an example of that. Instead of talking about product that was actually used, they're talking about ore samples. And they showed you this document and said, oh look, asbestos, asbestos, right? HC must mean Hammondsville Cosmetic. And you saw that that wasn't necessarily true when we were looking at that. And two ampoules, right? HC, five ampoules of ore. But they're not going to use it if they found asbestos in it. That's the whole point of doing selective mining. You check before you produce the product. And then you saw that HC, they use that, that label for industrial tap, as well as for cosmetic. And here's an example of that. April 1996, using transmission electronic microscopy combined with selected area and electron diffraction, we have been analyzed 21 samples of industrial talc with a general identification of HC. So they use that for industrial talc as well. During the same time frame, this is August of 97 and February of 96, this document is right in that time frame. Another example, we have examined three samples of talc using roofing material. These three talcs are designated HC. So they're using the HC designation for cosmetic talc, but also for industrial talc. And you heard Dr. Hopkins say that most of the talc they sold was industrial talc. Uh, that, that the uh, cosmetic talc is a different <coughs> process uh, and uh, a whole different testing um, protocol. The, um, another example of uh, what, what we were talking about is this document where they talk about the examination of top samples at the Argonaut, again, in the ore body. Here's the documents on the finished J&J. 
And then it turned, and they like to they talk to this, speak to this uh, table too, where Lacan says there is like a millionth of a percent of chrysotile in some section of the ore. Right? And then you look, and it, also an example of Macron reporting when they're finding way less than five fibers, when they're finding a fraction of a fiber. And then you look at the actual document, and it says an intensive examination has been made by X-ray refraction and TEM of 38 core samples taken from a new ore body, which Winters is contemplating exploiting. It's not saying we're using this, I'm like we're we're making sure, we're looking around to make sure we use the purest ore. And we're not going to use that. We're contemplating exploring. That's why they're sending out the phone. If there's any problems, we're not going to use it. And again, that's not showing you testing on the finished product. But then they like showing you this document that you could probably show a whole bunch of times. The research trial, right? This is after the scare. This document is dated in 1974. After the two New York scientists and all over the press at J&J saying, you know, if there, if there is an issue, and actually they talk about potential in this document, if there is a potential issue, potentially present, it's all over the press, they're investigating, this is before the FDA put it to bed, but there was no asbestos, they said, well, you know, let's look at all kinds of things we can do if it's there to try to get it out of baby powder, including these reagents, remember these chemical reagents? And so they did research studies, as companies do, and they made clear in these studies they were spiking the samples. I mean, these are the documents they're using to prove asbestos and baby powder. The ones where actually J&J is intentionally putting asbestos in to test a reagent, a research protocol. They're saying, we doped it, right? We doped it with 1% of fibrous anthophilite. We doped it with 2% of fibrous anthophilite. We're doping the samples. And what they don't, what they didn't show you, what we did, was the testing on the final product that Dartman did, right? On page 4, it talks about Dartman, Dr. R. Rounds of Dartman, looking for amphibols in, before the study started, in the final product, right? Not in the ore, not miles away in the line, but in the product. And here's what he said, the detected amphibole minerals did not appear in fibrous form in any, in any of the product samples. That's the Dartmouth report as recounted by J&J. There's no asbestos in the product samples. And then on this table they showed you this chart. They said, oh, well, here's part of the document where it doesn't say right on the page that they spike the samples. Okay. This is the research project in the 18-month period where they're spiking the samples as part of this project. And then we showed you related documents where they talk about, actually, this is March 74, right in that 18-month period, part of this dedication study, where they talk about spiking samples with chrysotile. Chrysotile, someone draws a picture of it, and they say in an experiment in which asbestos form particles were doped into the towel. Another document. Samples were doped to test the rejection efficiency of these three agents, and they're talking about chrysotile, doping in chrysotile. And then this document, Census Exhibit 8263, March 74, again, this is a month before this final report. And look at this. These samples line up. Let's do it. These samples line up perfectly with the ones in the study, right? 66 U or 66 U product, 66. Well, these are the these are the samples in the in this uh, research paper, this print protocol. And look. J&J &J Wintermine is asking Macron to look for chrysotile. The only document that says that. Why? Because they're spiking it. Of course they are. It's part of the research. So that's what they're relying on. Testing the old product never used. Re the documents of research product project where they're actually spiking the samples with asbestos. 
suggesting to you something the Dartmouth investigator said was not the truth, suggesting that that means there's asbestos in the finished product, Dartmouth says no. The product samples, no asbestos. And then we showed you this one from the South, remember the one from the South Plainfield Mill uh, in 84? And this is another company, this is another company's document. This is 1984, Cypress. And they showed you an inspection report from the Bureau of Mine Safety and Administration, Department of Labor. And they, they showed you where they found asbestos fibers in this mill that J and J didn't own. And a company that was making towel for a whole lot of other companies, as you heard Dr. Hawkins, making industrial town making cow for other folks. And then you saw that the finding related to what was on, on a couple of days, what was in the air, not in the bulk sample. It wasn't in the towel. No evidence it was in the towel. Again, innuendo, allegations, not evidence it was in the finished product that was sold to J&J. Then they claim, oh, J&J, they're so bad, they were telling customers that they could wash out the asbestos. Remember that? Not the truth. They showed you this plan to give it 2557. This is a letter to a customer after all this press about the asbestos and the beauty powder uh, in the early 70s. <coughs> they wrote saying, is there, a, you know, basically, is there asbestos? And they talked about all of their procedures. They talked about washing out impurities. But then they say they checked with scientific methods, x-ray, thermal analysis, TEM, to confirm the absence of asbestos. Not that we're washing it out, we're washing impurities, and then we are testing to make sure there's no asbestos. That's what they're telling customers. They like to show these Project 101 documents, uh, and this related to, and you heard Dr. Hopkins talk about this, this related to, you heard when the mines run out, you know, they, they exhaust, you can't, there's no more uh, clean top to mine, but you gotta look for other mines. This related to research on other mines, mines that they were using. Project 101, this, uh, in this, in this specifically was looking at a mine in California that they never used. And they talk about um, the reason we have to firm up our position on tremolite, now they told the FDA to look at it, and everybody, and the FDA knew, and it was openly discussed, that they had trace amounts of tremolite, the good rock uh, in their cow. And what the, what, the, what the question here being discussed is, can we go to a mine that has more tremolite? And so that's why they're asking, if you have more tremolite, is that going to be an issue? And that's the question. And they say top succeeding trace contents have never been approved. And they talk about the confusion that there are different varieties, right? And they're asking the doctor, the question, the question is, Medically, if we use more, is there going to be an issue? What a good company should do about a mine they haven't needed, they never used. And then there was a response to the document talking about that, um, that tremolite can have needle crystals that are those are the clean tribes we talked about, that they can penetrate the skin and cause irritation. And then they said, to the best of my knowledge, we have no factual information that this has ever happened. And then they talk about the General Johnson. Uh, the, uh, the Johnson & Johnson Air and several pediatri pediatricians expressed a concern over the possibility of the adverse effects on the lungs of babies or mothers. And you heard about the incidents where people were, not cancer, but people were choking, right, on too much um, dust inhalation from talcum powder. And they showed you uh, those commercials from, um, you know, some of them looked like they were in the 60s or 70s, uh, where there was uh, dust from the powder. And you know, and, and no evidence the plaintiffs saw any of those. In fact, the judge, I think, instructed the plaintiffs to see any of those, and there was no evidence. And I submit to you, they show those, to, you know, trying to make the company look bad. But think about the 70s and 60s. We did, all of us did things that we wouldn't do now. Nobody wore seatbelts. Kids weren't wearing bike helmets. Some of us in Jersey were chasing mosquito trucks on our bikes, right? People know a lot more now, and J&J is not running commercials because everybody knows dust generally. Not that it causes cancer, but you don't want to breathe in a lot of dust. And so, you know, those commercials are shown to make it just kind of make the company look bad. No evidence that 
any of the plaintiffs saw them. And they're talking about the fact that people, uh, there have been these incidents of choking here. And then they say, if we include tremolite in more than unavoidable trace amounts, uh, we can't, we, we may not even be able to say that, that, that it's safe to, to breathe. Because we don't know. We, we've tested it with trace amounts. And then they go on to say, don't use it. Don't use this line beyond the absolute minimum of the trace we already have. If it's been coming in, we're not going to use this one that has anything more than these trace uh, good fragments. But they'll show you these documents of doing the right thing. Let's look at alternative sources and not use them uh, if we're not sure they're safe. They'll show you this document, I'm sure, that says, this is not new, acting like, ooh, we know there's trace asbestos, right? And I submit to you, they might not show you this part where it makes clear it's tremolite. The good tremolite, not asbestos. This is not new. Yeah, it's not. FDA and we knew that there were trace amounts in the good rock. There's trace amounts in the good rock every year. And then, Plaintiff's Exhibit 1458, talking about, remember this one? It said, oh, J&J didn't want to use the concentration method because it was too sensitive. Well, then you heard we ran, we had Dr. Pooley and we had the Colorado School of Mines run a whole bunch of our samples through the concentration method. They came up clean. There's never any asbestos found in our product from the concentration method. But the concentration method, Dr. Pooley tried it out, and FDA tried it out, we tried it. We were interested in using the Beth book. Why are we paying the call all this money to do TEM if we didn't care about finding this method if it was there? That's why we had these experts try all these methods. And in the concentration method, here's Dr. Pooley's report, Defense Exhibit 8011, September 12, 1973. He's talking about concentration here. And they've been adding, they're spiking it to test it, right? Why he's fighting it to test it if you already have asbestos in it, it's kind of alleged. But he says that heavy liquid separation is a very inaccurate and unsuitable technique to adopt. That was the expert's conclusion. That's why the FDA and j and and others aren't using it for testing on tau. And then they showed you this document, plaintiff's 1458, that says, oh, look, they didn't want to use it because it was too sensitive. Well, it's like, if you have a liar counter on the beach and you keep finding seashells instead of metal or jewelry, keep finding the regular old rock instead of asbestos, yeah, you don't want that. You want a method that finds the asbestos, not a method that finds stuff that's not asbestos. And both the FDA and the Texas independent experts rejected the concentration method as a good way to find <coughs> asbestos in town, particularly because, as their experts agree, the concentration method can't find the most common find form of asbestos. Then they told they talked to Dr. <coughs> Dr. Hopkins about this document. I think Mr. Pennant here talking in the length about it, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2549, October 5th, 1974. It's a review meeting at J and J. And remember this, he kept trying, the plaintiff's were kept trying to get Dr. Hopkins to agree that J and J had concerns about using TEN. That J and J had grave concerns. Remember that? But Dr. Hopkins said, this is an outside, the CFTA is an outside industry group. And we were reporting on what other people were saying at the meeting. And why would J&J &J have grave concerns in 1974 when they've already been using TEM? They've already had that. You saw their, it was part of their regular quality assurance protocol since 1973, using it in some form since 71, but on a regular basis since 73, so why? That's not J&J, &J. we're already using it. Again, choosing to mislead you, spinning the company documents in a way inconsistent with the facts, inconsistent with the truth. They'll probably show you that one again, too. And the round robin testing. The companies and the FDA doing what you hope they would do, trying out a way to make sure they can find asbestos in the top, trying out all kinds of testing methodology, and then testing it to see if it works. And so this is on March 1977, and that's going to and they're testing tremolite, and they say this is the regular tremolite, the good kind, not, should not be detected as asbestos. 
And then you remember the plaintiff's lawyer saying, oh, well, why wouldn't you use asbestos? You know, something about, if you're looking for grapes, why would you put oranges? If you're looking for oranges, why would you put grapes? But then you heard, the truth was, they did use UISCC is asbestos. And it's not quite asbestos. You saw the paper that was asbestos. <coughs> so they tested, as you should, with the non-asbestos and the asbestos to see if the labs could find the asbestos and then tell the difference between the good rock and the bad rock. And it turns out that some labs could in this initial test, and some labs could put using the polarized light and the x-ray. And we turn to page, this is, it was clear that at five out of the seven labs could tell the difference between the good and the bad, and all of these folks found the asbestos. And then, there was some follow-up because some rats missed it. And this follow-up with the FDA involved, as you see. Dr. Gates, Dr. S, Dr. Gates from the FDA, and Dr. Wilson from the FDA and industry. And Macron came in to make sure the people doing the testing at these various companies were doing it the right way. Macron gave them instructions, they gave them protocols, uh, and then there was a retest, as you saw. March, uh, about a year later, in March of 78, it talks about uh, I'm closing a table which breaks the code for the recently completed task force on round robin. And the plaintiffs highlight this part, this is, this is the plaintiffs highlight this part, and this part, that we're only going to show you your own results, but they don't highlight this part where the, the results show that none of the company's products in these tests had any asbestos. We left that part out. That's what was, none of the company's products had any asbestos. That was the results. And they highlight this, destroy the code, right? Sounds nefarious, sounds terrible. So destroy the code where you find no asbestos. And then it turns out they had to destroy the code because some lawyer said you had antitrust problems. I think everybody else knows what, was, what, what is in everybody's problem. So the lawyer said, in order to avoid any antitrust lawsuits from the government, you got to do it this way. But everything's sinister, right? That was the code for the results where nobody found any asbestos in the product. And I bet they talked about the round robin. And then the FDA, after the retest and industry, was satisfied that over with white mice possibly the XRD declined as best as down to one tenth of one percent, uh, and that was a pretty good test to use. But J and J was doing one step better. They were going down to millions and millions of a percent using TEM as well as the other two to make sure that babies weren't being harmed, that people weren't being harmed. To make sure that they had the safest product on the market, and still doing that extensive testing uh, today. Then. I suspect they'll show you this. Oh, J and J told FDA that one percent asbestos in one uh, percent asbestos was safe for babies. No such thing. You heard Dr. Hopkins say we had zero tolerance. That's why we're doing all of this extensive testing. That's why we're having the best labs in the world look at it. Again, mischaracterizing what the evidence and what the documents say. Here's a document, plaintiff's trial exhibit 2506. From uh, the meeting with FDA uh, and J and J, and they're talking about the symposium where Mount Sinai people admitted their analysis based on optical microscopy of our product is wrong, and then they're talking about talking uh, further discussions with the FDA, uh, and then they talk about the guy from FDA, Dr. Ironman. He's focused on this OSHA limit, and OSHA, as you might remember, had a standard that. Uh, for people that were working in occupations, that you could have 1% um, asbestos, anything 1% below was fine as in an occupational setting. So this Dr. FDA was focused on that, and he asked J&J, &J, can you do an analysis to see how your product, assuming there was any asbestos, stands up to the 1%. Now, we didn't think there should be any asbestos in but if the government asks you to do something, you do it. And so we did this analysis, and we set our calculation under its test, we may have substantial amounts. But then the FDA, someone else at the FDA said, this guy who asked for this analysis is a knucklehead, basically. He said, Dr. Whitaker at FDA appeared skeptical, and Dr. Ironman's report. Of course, 
a pretty much one percent as nice as anything. Jane, Jane, you believe that. But when this guy from the FDA asked for it, they did the analysis. And so it's not fair for them to say, oh yes, J and J concluded that one percent asbestos uh, was okay. That is not the truth at all. Zero tolerance, no asbestos. That's why we did all of this testing. And J and J goes on to say, and they've showed you this, and this is the truth. J and J stressed J and J's full uh, policy, full cooperation with FDA. If there's any scientific studies, <coughs> any question of safety and health, hold on. If there's any credible evidence about the safety, we would pull it off the market. And you know what? Johnson and Johnson did hit, as you saw, with all of these lawsuits. And, you know, they could pull it off the market and stop this, but it's not right. It's safe. They're going to stand by and give people a choice. If your product's safe, you don't. I mean, they could, but it would be a suit, but it's not right. And sometimes you stand, I mean, they, they, they could pay money in lawsuits and, and get out, but sometimes. You know what? Sometimes lawsuits have gone too far. And when you have a history of this, objection is sustained. Striking that completely from the record. The jury is not to consider it. Sometimes you stand up for what you believe in. When you stand up for the truth. Then I'm going to show you this document, I'm sure. Again, everything's sinister. This is kind of exhibit 2415. There are other objects that characterization. That's completely outside of it. 